right, we're in Jeremiah chapter 14 and 15 tonight. Jeremiah 14 and 15. As you turn there, let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, that we can come before you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the word that you have given. Thank you for the fact that you continually reached out to people who um, kind of half-heartedly responding to you on one hand, and then uh, you kept encouraging the prophet who just he had a hard road. But thank you that you never left him. Thank you that you never leave us. Thank you that you never forsake us. Lord, we pray that you'd uh, guide us and teach us tonight. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, I was going to ask, have you ever had to? But if you've had kids, I, I, I know you've had to do this before. You force them to apologize. And that's not a matter of if. That's a matter of when that, that comes down. And, you know, when you do that, it never comes out sincere. You listen to that apology, and you're like, well, okay, well, yeah, the, you, you meant that. They get the words out, uh, but the words are all you can get out from them when you try to force that. You know, it's just muttered. They're just trying to get out of trouble. Sometimes people try to treat God the same way. They give him the same sort of apology or confession. And, you know, they might say that they've sinned, but, you know, they don't really want to do anything about it because they're not going to God in true humility. That's not what they're, they're just trying to get out of trouble. Well, that's the way the kingdom of Judah was with the Lord. God had promised them immense trouble. A lot of things were coming their way. They'd stubbornly persisted in idolatry and rebellion. And in chapter 14, to read some of the words, it would seem as if they had a change of heart because the people actually seemed to confess sin. Does it change anything? Well, no. Their confession wasn't honest because it was never accompanied by actions. God desires honesty from us, and even in the hard things. And as honest as dishonest, rather, as the nation was regarding their sin, the prophet Jeremiah was brutally honest regarding his depression. He was going through some really tough trials as he proclaimed the oracles of God. Now, was that something he needed to mask from the Lord? Because sometimes we think, like, we can't bring those things to the Lord. Well, absolutely not. He could just as, be just as honest in his depression as he was in his praise. And so honesty, right? Honest confession is always best, be it in our sin or our emotions. And so let's look at Jeremiah 14. He starts uh, talking about grief really over the drought uh, that's in the land, verses 1 through 6. Verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Judah mourns and her gates languish. They mourn for the land and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Now we're not told the exact time frame that this took place. We know that there were many droughts in the land of Israel. Verse 1, though, it does set the context for us because it tells us a drought. Very specific here from the Lord to Jeremiah concerning these droughts. This got to keep that in context. All of chapter 14, really chapter 15. There probably doesn't need to be a chapter break right there. Um, Of course, this is a very important issue for them. Prior to modern-day irrigation techniques and technologies that exist today, Israel was extremely dependent on seasonal rainfall, and that's why God wrote it into their covenant as we'll see tonight. If they were obedient to the Lord, God would bring the rain. If they were disobedient, God would withhold the rain. Absolutely dependent upon the Lord. God could use it as part of his discipline. Well, how bad were the droughts here? And we know of other times where it was so bad that the, you know, remember Elijah had to get fed by ravens and people had to sell off oil to make money because no water to be found. So no crops would grow and it was terrible in the past. How bad was it here? Well, the whole land was mourning over it. The gates, of course, that's a place of power, that's a place of discussion like today's town hall. They were languishing. Everybody from the capital city of Jerusalem all the way through the land of Judah, crying out in anguish. Verse 3 goes on to describe the uh, conditions here. The lads, excuse me, the nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. Because the ground is parched, for there was no rain in the land. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. So everyone was suffering from the noblemen to the plowmen. The cisterns where they would go to collect the rainwater. Well, they were empty of drinking water. The farmers had nothing to you know, irrigate their crops. And as a result, people everywhere experiencing shame, confusion. They're languishing. They're deep in their suffering, and there seemed to be no relief in sight. It didn't have to be this way. Again, one of God's promises concerning the people and the land 
is that the people would never lack water. As long as the people walked in covenant with God, God promised that he would bless them with all the water that they ever needed. You can see that in Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. Of course, this isn't what happened. The people had abandoned God, and thus they walked away from the blessing that God had graciously extended to them. This is the same sort of desolation, of course. This happened physically for them, but spiritually, this is the same sort of desolation that comes when God's people abandon him, when we turn away, because you think about what we could have in the Lord. We could walk in the abundant life that God promises. We could experience the daily filling of the Holy Spirit. We could walk in the knowing forgiveness of God, experience that intimacy with Christ that the Lord desires for us. But when we turn away, when we choose our sin, well, we're the ones who suffer, right? We're the ones missing out. Oh, God promises us one thing, but we choose something else. God promises of grace and blessing are always there, but we're the ones that turn away. And it is shameful. It's confounding. It should be shameful. You know, it's a foolish thing to turn from the provision of God to the emptiness of sin. But we do that so often because, you know, our flesh just appeals to us in that way. We think that we can gain so much more for ourselves when we do things our way versus when we do things that the Lord says to do. Man's way is always going to leave us disappointed. It's always going to leave us confused and confounded. God's way is always, always better. Verse 5, yes, the deer also gave birth in the field, but left because there was no grass. And the wild donkey stood on the desolate heights. They sniffed at the wind like jackals. Their eyes failed because there were no grass, was no grass. So it wasn't just the people who suffered, right? It was even the animals. Everything in the land suffered. Why? Because God's people had turned away from them. Donkeys, hardy animals, should have been able to do fine. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's always collateral damage when God's people turn into sin. Sin always affects someone. It always affects something more than us. It's never limited to the individual. We think it is. We lie to ourselves and say that it is. But it's never limited to just us. When weighing a temptation, <laughs> beloved, we need to consider the cost. You know, is that 20 seconds of pleasure worth 20 years of pain or more? Who else is going to get caught up in the consequences of what I'm trying to do right now? You know, literally, our choices could affect generations yet to come. We've got to consider that cost there. There it was, even the animals there affected. There is a prayer for mercy starting in verse 7. The first prayer for mercy, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. Now, I need to let you know, scholars debate whether or not this is the prayer of the nation or whether these are prayers of Jeremiah on behalf of the nation. And those who claim that uh, these are Jeremiah's words, they point to the willingness to confess sin as he's compassionately identifying himself with the people. And of course, Jeremiah much more willing to confess sin than others. Now, those who believe that these are the words of the nation point to the insincerity that God's going to identify later on. Now, there's no doubt Jeremiah did speak these words. After all, these are included in the book that bears his name, right? But it seems more likely that these words accurately reflect the heart of the nation. Even in their pride and their sin, they, they knew they were in trouble. They could tell things were going wrong because they had this drought going on. This is something that affected all of them. And the, the idea that the drought physically affecting the nation would help them turn their attention to God, well, that fact ought not to surprise us. Again, one of the specific purposes of God's discipline, we know, is to grab our attention, grab hold of us, get our eyes back on the Lord. God never disciplines us because it brings us pleasure. Of course not. He doesn't like to discipline us. No parent likes to discipline their children. But he disciplines us to bring us to confession and repentance and restoration. Now, sadly for the nation, it seems like they went through part of that, part of the way, but they didn't go as far as they needed. They did do some things right, seemingly so, at least from the words here. What did they do right first? They rightly identified the cause of the drought, not the random chance of the weather, not bad luck. It came directly as a result of their promise with God. God had promised the people, again, that he would provide rain if they walked with him, but he also specifically promised droughts if they did not. And you need to see this from Deuteronomy because this is written in their covenant with the Lord. This is what they agreed to do when they entered into this relationship with God, saying, you're going to be our king, we're going to be your people. And Deuteronomy 28, 23 through 24, and your heavens, which are over you, shall be over your head shall be bronze. 
The earth which is on you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. In other words, if you break this covenant, if you walk away, this is what's going to happen to you. It'll be like bronze over your head. You're not going to get anything from the sky. And what comes down is going to be dust. He specifically promised the droughts if they walked away in disobedience. And again, they could have avoided all of this if one, they had been obedient to the Lord. But two, if they had properly humbled themselves in true repentance when they did fail. God knew they would fail. He also gave provision for them when they did fail. The problem is they didn't take advantage of that. They continued steadfastly in their disobedience. And God promised at that point, that's when you're going to experience the drought. Now, begs the question, because obviously we're reading about Old Testament, the relationship between God and his people Israel, the punishment that they experienced. Can we as a church expect the same sort of thing? Well, not really. Obviously, God never changes. It's not like he was a different God with the Hebrews that he is with us today. He's the same yesterday and forever. But we are included in a different covenant relationship with God than the nation of Israel. The covenant that Moses had and outlined in Deuteronomy and elsewhere was a conditional covenant. And that's what we see precisely in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, very specifically. If the people obeyed, then they would be blessed. If the people disobeyed, then they would be cursed. Those words are used. The new covenant we have under Christ Jesus is unconditional. Obviously, we couldn't keep the covenant perfectly if we tried. Jesus kept it, keeps it on our behalf. Our salvation is completely wrapped up in his work done in our place. So two different covenants. That said, we can and do experience variations in our relationship with God based on our disobedience and our obedience. And we know this from our experience. When we walk away in sin, well, we can expect God's hand of discipline to be upon us. But when we humbly submit ourselves to him in repentance, then what? We experience the abundance of his grace. Like Israel, we ought to be willing to examine ourselves to see if we ourselves might be the cause of our lack of intimacy with the Lord our God. You ever get to that place where it feels like my prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? It might be at that point worth looking at our lives and saying, is there some sort of unconfessed, unrepentant sin in my life? Are there unloving attitudes? Is there an unwillingness for me to be in the Bible and spend time in prayer listening for God's voice rather than me just speaking to him or whatever? If there is, then you confess it, you turn from it, and you be done with it. Well, that's one thing that they did right. They recognize the source of their problem. Secondly, at least they seem to honestly confess their sins. They say, for our backslidings are many, we've sinned against you. Now, no doubt, the words, those were the truth. There's no way they could have denied the fact that they'd sinned. After all, they were talking with the all-knowing God. You can't say, well, I haven't done this, when he knows precisely that you have. It's useless for us to try to hide our sin from the Lord. Might as well confess, because he already knows it anyway. Our confession brings us into agreement with God, We're not going to bring the Almighty God in agreement with us, saying, oh, look, it's not really sin, and let me tell you all the reasons why it's not really sin. It doesn't work that way. No, we agree with God in confession. Thirdly, they appeal to God based on his character, where they say, do it for your name's sake. Israel understood they didn't deserve the mercies of God. If God gave them what they deserved, they'd all be lost. But if God acted according to his promises and his person, then they could know God would be merciful. God, of course, promised to always leave a remnant because he said he would, he's merciful, and he always did. Now, no matter what the people did in disobedience, the glory of God's name meant that God would always be faithful. Now, if Israel did all that right, and that sounds like a lot of really good things, what is it that they do wrong? Well, all that they did, that's as far as they went. Confession is good, but confession that leads to true repentance is better. Uh, That's what God's going to point out in verse 10. But for now, the nation's making this attempt uh, to make their case for God to give them mercy. Verse 8, Oh, the hope of Israel, his Savior in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land and like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for the night? Uh, Question, was he still the hope of Israel? Was he still the Savior? Yes. Even in the times of discipline, even in the times of his judgment, yes, that never changed. You know, God was still their hope. God was still their savior, even in times of discipline. Now, although that truth could be affirmed, it felt, I'm sure, profoundly different. God was indeed their savior, but at the time it felt more like he was a stranger at the time because God had removed his hand of blessing from the land. 
And it seemed as if God did not treat his people as his people. Verse 9, why should you be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O Lord, are in our midst when we are called by your name. Do not leave us. So it felt like not only was God a stranger, but he was a powerless stranger at that. Wasn't God even capable of helping Judah? Well, of course he was. God's never powerless. And that's the point. That's how they're appealing to him. They knew what God was capable of, and so although it didn't seem like he was doing anything at the moment, they were asking him to act as their God. Now, here's the thing. In actuality, God was acting as their God, absolutely acting as their God. What was he doing? He was upholding all the curses that he said that he was going to do as their God. He said, I will do these things when you're disobedient. God was being absolutely faithful to his word. They may not have liked his actions as God, but they were still godly. God's never powerless. God's never off his throne. God always acts according to his perfect character and his perfect will. That we can be certain of. We might not always like what God allows to happen in that, but God never stops being God. We can affirm that at all times. So God gives his answer to their prayer in verse 10. No. Verse 10, thus says the Lord to his people, thus they have loved to wander, they have not restrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sin. So the people ask for mercy. They ask God to act on their behalf. God says, no. Can God say no in answers to prayer? Absolutely, he can. God's God, we're not. Just because we pray a prayer does not mean that God is obligated to give us what we ask. Now, some people would object, say, wait a second. I remember Jesus teaching something different. Did Jesus say that when we ask and, you know, ask for anything, believing in faith, know that God will grant us to it, grant it to us, rather. Well, yes, he did say that, and no, he didn't. Let's look at the context of what he said. We'll actually get to this in a few weeks in Mark, Mark eleven twenty two through 24. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. So Jesus does guarantee an answer to prayer. But where does he tell us to place our faith? Not in ourselves, in God, Right? If we have faith in God, then we ought to be humbling ourselves before him, seeking to walk according to his will. If we are, then we can be sure that the prayers that God the Spirit leads us to pray will be answered exactly as God intends for them to be answered. But if we're just asking for a blank check to get whatever we want outside of being submitted unto God, then we can't honestly say we're exercising true faith in God, are we? God is not obligated to give us whatever wish list we might desire simply because we're born-again Christians. Sometimes, and especially when we're in sin, God says no. That's his right, and that's exactly what he did with the Jewish nation. Specifically, he points out that the Jews were still in their sin. No, I'm not going to release this from you because you're still in your sin. They have loved to wander, he said. They have not restrained their feet. They may have been honest with their words about their sin in verse 7, but they never truly repented from their sin. They never once changed their ways. They uttered words of confession, but their hearts remained hardened. And confession without repentance will never change our consequences. Now, sometimes there's going to be consequences to our actions no matter what we do, but no doubt that God is not under any obligation to respond to an unrepentant heart. And that's what they had. They had an excuse as well, really was an excuse. They had false teachers in their midst. Verse 11, then the Lord said to me, do not pray for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Now, this is the third time, by the way, in several chapters that God tells Jeremiah not to pray for the people. Now, this time he does put a specific qualification on it. It's not that he... Jeremiah can't pray for the hearts of the people to truly humble themselves and repent, but rather he cannot pray for their good. The idea is that God did not want to hear the prayers of Jeremiah for the people to be blessed, did not want to hear the prayers of Jeremiah for God to remove his hand of punishment from them. 
That would be wasted words. That would be wasted breath in his opinion. God had sovereignly determined their punishment. Nothing would change his mind from that. God had given them over to the consequences of their sin, and that's where they would remain. And as we've seen many times before, how tragic it is when God finally gives somebody over. We want to pray our hearts would always remain soft before the Lord. God would never have to give someone over. But not only would God not hear Jeremiah's prayer of intercession, he would not honor their acts of sacrifice. Whether it be fasting or offering, God would not relent from his punishment. Well, why? Isn't that what they needed to do? Well, go back to verse 10. That's the reason why the people hadn't humbled their hearts. They hadn't changed their ways. Why would God honor sacrifice and fasting that was merely ritual? What would be the point in that? Ritualistic religious acts are meaningless. Just because somebody goes through the motions of religion does not mean that his or her heart is broken before the Lord. David understood this. When David was caught in his sin, he was writing his psalm of confession and repentance in Psalm 51. He said this in verse 16 and 17, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Now, God would delight in burnt offerings. The offerings were sweet smells to him. As it said over and over again in Leviticus, what does David mean when he says God would not delight in a burnt offering? God would not delight in a burnt offering that was just done out of ritual to get it out of the way, to say, well, I went through the motions and I fulfilled the law. He couldn't do that. That wouldn't mean anything to the Lord. No, he needed a broken and contrite heart and then go and offer his offering. That's what God wanted. God wants true heartfelt repentance. This is where they offer their excuse. Verse 13, then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, or worthless saying, and the deceit of their heart. So here's the objection that Jeremiah raises on behalf of the people. He basically says, But the people have been lied to. It's not their fault they haven't repented, because, you know, prophets are saying, now, you're not upset with them, so they don't need to do anything. Of course, God hadn't sent them. People were saying that, but God hadn't given them that word to say. These were false prophets. They were false teachers speaking a word to the people that God had not given them. Now, that wasn't God's fault. It was the fault of the people who were listening to them, right? Now, no doubt there's a lot of danger in false teaching, but the only way that false teaching is ever successful is if there are people willing to listen to it. And that's just as true then it is today. A lot of people get stuck in places and they say, well, I was just given all this false teaching in my church. This guy started going off the ends and the deep end. And Well, why did you stay when you saw it was wrong? A lot of places would go out of business overnight if people just gave up and left the false teaching behind. God had given the people very specific instructions to judge the prophets, Deuteronomy 18. And those who were judged to be false were supposed to be taken out and killed. The problem was the people didn't judge them. They didn't want to judge the false teachers because they liked what the false prophets were saying. It was a word that tickled their ears. It was a word that let them continue in their sin. Just keep doing what you're doing because God's not going to judge you anyway. So they said, well, that sounds good to me. I'm not going to judge that as false. I'm not going to take that guy out back and kill him. Thus, the people are still responsible for their own sin because they're the ones who took it in. Now, that's not to say that God wouldn't hold the false prophets to account. He most certainly would. God holds all false teachers to account. Look at verse 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not sin, and who say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. And they will have no one to bury them them, nor their wives, their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness on them. So the false prophets, they most certainly would be punished. They'd be killed by the very things that they said God would never allow into the land. God said, in their opinion, that he would never bring the sword of the famine. God said, it's going to be by sword and famine that you die, that you'll be destroyed. And again, it wouldn't just be the false teachers. All the Jews in the land would suffer. There'd be massive destruction, so much so there wouldn't be enough people to bury the dead. The ultimate desecration will come as the bodies of dead Jews lay exposed in the streets, rotting in the sun. 
course, there's great sorrow over this, starting in verse 17. Therefore, you shall say this word to them. Let my eyes flow with tears night and day. Let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke, with a very severe blow. If I go out into the field, then behold, those lame by the, slain by the sword. If I enter the city, then behold, those sick from the famine. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in a land they do not know. So Jeremiah, of course, was given a word from God, a word of grief for the people. And he described how the prophet would weep for them. If the people of the land were grieved uh, due to the lack of rain, imagine the grief that would come to the imminent Babylonian invasion, dead bodies piled up everywhere, the nation broken, none exempt. Those who survived the onslaught would be taken captive, removed from the land. This is a faith that was beyond terrible. And Jeremiah would weep. All of them needed to weep. They needed to understand the severity of their sin. Sin is always worth weeping over. I wonder sometimes if our hearts, my heart doesn't get too callous to sin that pops up. Am I too willing to just gloss over? We need to be willing to weep over our sin and see how bad that it truly is. There's a second prayer for mercy, starting in verse 19. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, but there was no good. And for the time of healing, and there was trouble. Now, did God hate Jerusalem? Of course not. It was in his love that he had to act. He wouldn't allow them to go on in their pagan ways. He loved them enough to do what was necessary to bring them to a point of repentance. Now, that said, it certainly would have felt as if God had hated them, because all the blessings that Israel once experienced would be gone, all the healing no more, all the peace removed. It would have felt as if the Jews had no hope in God and that God had completely rejected them. Now, these are very honest feelings, even if it wasn't the truth. Of course, we know God was faithful to leave a remnant in the land. And by the way, we know that's true. And how so? If for nothing else, the fact that the Jewish nation exists today, very verifiable proof that God did not completely reject them. Of course, there's nothing wrong with expressing our honest emotions to the Lord, but once we have, we always need to fall back on the truth of the Scripture. That's what they really hadn't done yet. Verse 20, We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Do not abhor us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us, as if God was the one breaking the covenant. Once more, the people seem to confess their sin. They seem to take on the responsibility, freely acknowledge their own fault. It's a good and necessary first step, but it can't be the only step. You know, if we were to confess our sins to the Lord and then run right back into that same sin all over again, has it truly been confession? Because true confession is agreeing with God that what he says about sin is true, right? So if we agree that it's sinful... There's a corollary to that. It means we agree that it's so simple as something we're to stop, we're to avoid, that we're to wage war against in our life. But what happens when we say something is sinful, then we go back gladly and gleefully jump into it all over again? I guess we haven't truly agreed with God, have we? Because we haven't agreed with the need to forsake it. And once more, the people appeal to God for his mercies. And as before, they appeal to God's glory and His promises. God had promised to be with His people and to provide for them. And so they're not asking for help because they've done anything to deserve it, but because God had promised to do all these things for them. And as with their confession, that would have been good if they had followed all the way through to repentance. Again, God's wrath towards Israel was His faithfulness because that's exactly what He said He would do in response to their sin, and He would do it. Is it possible to have good theology and still be outside the will of God? Yes. That's exactly what Judas shows right here, isn't it? They, they knew the truth. They knew all the right words, but their hearts were still hardened as God had already proclaimed. And what they needed at this point was not more words, not more sacrifices. They needed true brokenness, honest confession. They needed to be like David. Remember when he was caught in sin after proclaiming the census, and God gave him a choice of the various punishments that he could receive, what did he need to do? He just wanted to submit himself into the hand of God. God, whatever you decide to do is right. Don't let me go in the hands of men. Just put me in your hands. 
That's what they needed to do. Lord, we just give ourselves over to you. What you decide to do is righteous. Verse 22, are there any among the idols of the nation that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, O Lord, our God? Therefore, we will wait for you since you've made all these. <laughs> took a long time, but the people are starting finally to acknowledge the futility of idolatry. They'd worshiped these false gods and done their rain dances, I'm sure. And, you know, these uh, statues didn't bring anything. But finally, they realized only the God of creation can give them the rain that they needed. But unfortunately, too little, too late. God responds to all of this in chapter 15, and again, he gives an answer. What's his answer? His answer is no, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable towards this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And it shall be, if they say to you, where should we go? Then you should tell them, thus says the Lord. Such as for death to death, and such as for the sword to the sword, and such are for the famine to the famine, and such are for the captivity to the captivity. And I'll appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord. The sword to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour and to destroy. And just as God told Jeremiah before not to pray for the people, he affirms again, he will not listen to intercession this time. Even if Moses or Samuel personally interceded for the people, and Moses was known to intercede for the people many, many times, they would not change God's mind. There is a time that God runs out of patience, and he'll act, and that time was then and there. People will be judged, experience a variety of means in the judgment, but it's just the same cause. Some might die by the sword, others might die by famine, but they'd all experience the judgment of God. The bottom line is destruction, horrendous destruction. No matter how much they prayed or brought offerings or fasted, they had done so in insincerity, they had done so without fruits of true repentance, and they would face the judgment of God. And God tells them precisely why, verse 4, I will hand them over to trouble to all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. There are many kings in Judah who did evil. Many, many. There were many who walked in the ways of the idolatrous kings of the north and Israel. But Manasseh in the south set the gold standard for evil among the kings of Judah. Over his 55-year reign, he rebuilt all the high places of pagan worship that his godly father, Hezekiah, had torn down. He raised up altars for Baal worship. He placed pagan altars in the Jerusalem temple. He used witchcraft, participated in human sacrifice, set up a carved image of Asherah in the temple, and much more. And the Bible tells us that he engaged in much more wickedness than the evil Amorites who had been in the land whom God judged by bringing in the Hebrews in the first place. Read all about it in 2 Kings chapter 21. He was an evil guy. And it wasn't just him alone. He led the charge, but people had to follow him, and they did. And as a result, God promised to judge the nation. In fact, uh, 2 Kings 24, 3 and 4 affirm it. Surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon you to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now keep in mind, this final proclamation here was given after the revival of Josiah, which was Manasseh's grandson. Judgment of God was delayed for a bit, for a time, out of God's mercy, knowing that one last revival was coming. But it was still determined to come because of what God said he would do, he would do. Verse 5, For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask how you're doing? Who'd be left to pity the Jews? It had always been the Lord God who showed compassion to Jerusalem. Nobody else did. He alone had protected and brought them this far. And now that he would turn away, who would be left? If we don't have the Lord, we have no one. We have no hope, right? We have nothing. What would you have left? Who's going to have pity on you? Verse 6, you have forsaken me, says the Lord. You've gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting. And I will winnow them with the wintering fan in the gates of the land. I'll bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they do not return from their ways. Despite all the protests of the people, they had turned away from God. It's not that they were just negligent, you know, and they didn't do what God desired. It's they actively had forsaken him and gone the other direction. They went backwards, right? And so this is why their confession and their offerings were ignored by God, because they, they never repented from these things. God had shown them mercy time and time and time again. He grew weary of it. 
the human term, right? Can God grow tired? He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. But he does grow weary in his patience. Eventually, the patience of God expired, and he promised that he would destroy his own people. You know that's bad when he says, I will destroy my people. Now, question, if God did this with Israel, could he do the same with us? And again, it goes back to the idea of the church being in a different covenant relationship with God than Israel. What the Jews experienced in their rejection by God is a picture, at least for us, application-wise, that shows us the hopelessness of relying upon ourselves. Left to ourselves and our own inability, I should say, to keep the law of God, every single one of us would be in exactly the same boat as the rebellious Jews because we would be attempting to justify our actions. We would be the ones attempting to find excuses for our sin, hoping to convince somehow, convince God not to judge us righteously. Now, thankfully, that's not what our relationship with God is based upon. Our covenant is based upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes all the difference in the world. Now, that said, God's mercy and his grace is never something for us to take for granted. Simply because God has not yet let us experience the consequences of our sin doesn't mean he'll never allow us to experience the consequences of our sin. And if we continue in unrepentant sin, God will undoubtedly discipline us. Verse 8, their widows will be increased to me more than the sand of the seas. I will bring against them, against the mother of the young men, a plunderer at noonday. I will cause anguish and terror to fall on them suddenly. She languishes who has borne seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She's been ashamed and confounded. And the rem- remnant of them I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. See, for the Jews, they'd experienced the opposite of the Abrahamic blessing. Remember what God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Their descendants would number more than the sand of the sea, more than the stars of the sky. Yet now, God promises that number would be the number of widows in the land. Turn on its head. The judgment of God would be severe, it would be swift. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, obviously, heavy message for Jeremiah to preach. (laughs) Heavy message for anyone to preach thousands of years later. It grieved him to preach this. And remember, it caused grief among his family and his friends in the land. Remember, his own family had persecuted him at one point. And so Jeremiah raises up a couple of complaints. His first complaint found in verse 10, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. Jeremiah hadn't done anything wrong, but people treated him as if he had. The prophet you know, had the same reputation as a loan shark. This guy's crooked. He's evil. Get him out of here. The word of God he proclaimed didn't bring peace. It brought strife and his despair. Mom, why did you even give me birth? He thought it would have been better if he had never been born. So what does he do? He cries out to God, which is exactly what he needed to do. Sometimes we get the idea that those who are godly never go through times of despair. And it always amazes me that that tends to creep into the church because all you need to do is crack the book of Job one time and find out the opposite. But if not Job, then Jeremiah. Jeremiah was downright depressed about all the stuff that was going on around him. And he doesn't hesitate to call upon God. And that's not to say Jeremiah would always receive a cheerful answer from the Lord. But no doubt he always had the sure presence of God with him, always. And so do we. Jesus never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We can take all our doubts, our questions, our despair to him, and we don't need to fear that he's going to abandon us and say, you shouldn't have asked me that. He won't do that. God gives an answer for Jeremiah, but really for the people. But it starts in verse 11. The Lord said, Surely it will be with your remnant. Surely I will cause the enemy to intercede with you in the time of adversity and in the time of affliction. Now, I need to mention that translations vary wildly on this verse. And let me read a few different versions for you. ESV says, The Lord said, Have I not set you free for their good? Have I not pleaded with you before the enemy in the time of trouble and in the time of distress? New American Standard says, Surely I will set you free for the purposes of good. Surely I will cause the enemy to make supplication to you in a time of disaster and a time of distress. Holman Christian Standard says, I will surely set you free and care for you. I will certainly intercede for you in a time of trouble, in your time of distress with the enemy. So who's praying for whom here, right? Is the enemy praying with Jeremiah? Is God praying for Jeremiah? Is the enemy pleading to Jeremiah? What's going on here? 
Every translation has scholarly support. And I'm not going to attempt to try to solve the translation issue here because I'm not that skilled. At the very least, it does seem that God addresses Jeremiah first. He is going to address the people. Remember, Jeremiah is deep in despair. The one thing that's apparent in all of this, God had not forgotten him. His eyes were on Jeremiah, right? God did not hear the prayers of the people, but he certainly heard the prayers of his prophet, of Jeremiah. And somehow, some way, God was going to take him through. God would make sure everything's going to be all right. Jeremiah would experience affliction. God would see him through. God would provide for him. Now, thankfully, that's the same assurance we have in Christ. He will see us through these things. Verse 12, can anyone break iron? The northern iron and the bronze, your wealth and your treasures, I will give as plunder without price because of all your sin throughout your territories. And I will make you cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know. For a fire is kindled in my anger which shall burn upon you. Now, obviously, this is not to Jeremiah, this is to the nation. God tells them that his judgment has not changed. Strong nation is going to come down from the north. Everything that belonged to the Jews be taken away, be plundered. And just as the Hebrews had taken the spoil of the land when they first came in by the hand of God, so would the possessions of the Hebrew become spoil for the Babylonians. They would experience a fire of God's judgment, and far worse than the weapons of the bronze and the iron of the enemy, far worse would be the all-consuming fire of the Lord God. Jeremiah has a second complaint. He goes on. He's not really done complaining the first time. He's just picking up here, verse 15. Oh, Lord, you know... Remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. And your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake, I've suffered rebuke. He continues to take his despair for the Lord. He's asking for several things. One, God would see him. He says, remember me and visit me. See me, Lord. Second, he asked that God would rise up for him. Take vengeance for me. Act in my behalf. Third, that God would protect him. Don't take me away. Don't, don't leave me off here. Now notice how this seems to be the opposite of how God had seemed to treat the nation because God had, what, forsaken his people. He had refused to rise up for them. He had purposely brought about their defeat and ruin. Basically, Jeremiah is asking, treat me differently than everybody else. I don't want to be like everybody else here. Why? Well, because unlike the rest of the nation, Jeremiah had been faithful unto God. The rest of them hadn't. The suffering Jeremiah experienced was unjust. The people suffered because of their sin. The prophet was persecuted. He suffered because he spoke the word of God. And so that's why he's asking, treat me differently than all the others. Verse 16, your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I'm called by your name, O Lord of hosts. I did not sit in the assembly of mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. He willingly served in his calling. It was a tough calling, but it was a calling from the Lord. It was a joy for him to know the word of the Lord. He treasured the things that God treasured. He didn't rejoice with the nation as the nation was engaging in sin. He didn't sit with them in that sort of thing. He didn't give approval to that sort of thing. No, he sat on the side of the Lord. He experienced righteous indignation at the flagrant sin of the people. Again, he treasured the things that God treasured. He abhorred the things that God abhorred. And then we ask then, in light of all that, should not that have guaranteed his safety? Should that not have ensured his prosperity? To listen to many teachers today, you'd think we'd, that'd be exactly the idea. Christians are often told that, you know, as long as you obey the Lord, you'll experience the physical prosperity of the Lord. But experience and theology tells us that's not the case. Multitudes of Christians around the world are faithful in their walk with the Lord Jesus, and they routinely experience persecution. And the New Testament expressly tells us to expect those things tells us that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's understandable that this could leave us confused. What's going on here, Lord? I left Jeremiah confused. Look at verse 18. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as waters that fail? Why was his pain unending? Why did the persecution continue? Why did it seem like God's provision was unreliable, like a river that would ebb and flow? These wadi rivers that would flood in some seasons and be barren in other seasons. Why did it seem like that? And again, this is very honest, isn't it? Not accurate, but it's honest. It's not the truth, but this is how he felt. 
Never fear to take your honesty to God. Guess what? He's big enough to handle it. Even as he lovingly brings us correction along the way when needed. So God does answer the prophet, starting in verse 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord, If you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me. If you take the precious out, if you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. First thing, God had not abandoned Jeremiah. God had not turned away from him. God had not been unreliable. God had not given him over to the enemy. Now, Jeremiah may not have abandoned God by turning away into sin. God's still calling him to come back. Where did he turn away to? Well, he did turn into a little bit of self-pity. Understandable, of course. Understand, any one of us would have done the same thing. But guess what? At some point, the self-pity needs to stop. Sometime you've got to turn around. And Jeremiah needed to get his eyes back onto the Lord. And when he did, guess what? He'd find God was right there. God would protect him. God would give him the strength to stand. And what did God ask of Jeremiah? Well, he asked faithfulness. And Jeremiah faced every temptation that there could have been to compromise the word of God. Because every other so-called prophet in the land spoke words of comfort to the people. They seemed to live in relative comfort. They weren't abandoned by their family. They weren't abandoned by their friends. Jeremiah was. Jeremiah was one of the only prophets speaking the words of God, and yet he experienced terrible hardship. So it would have been very tempting to kind of water it down, compromise the word that God had given him. It would have been very tempting for Jeremiah to you know, just start walking in the direction of the people. And God said, don't do that. It was the people who needed to repent and come to him, not Jeremiah going to them. We never compromise the word of God, never. The Bible says what it says, and we don't need to apologize for it. We don't need to find more ways to make it you know, more palatable or acceptable to the culture around us. Now, obviously, we're not to be offensive in the way that we share, but the gospel itself is an offense to those who are perishing. It is foolishness to them. And that's a fact we've got to accept, not back away from. And God wanted Jeremiah to be faithful to the word. God wants us to do the same. Verse 20, I will make you to this people a fortified bronze wall. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked. I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. If Jeremiah was uncompromisingly faithful, then he would find that God would do exactly as he had asked God to do, right? God would be with them. God would fight for him. God would strengthen him for what was to come, all those things that he prayed for. God would deliver Jeremiah through his persecution, even if he didn't deliver him out of it. God would give the prophet whatever was needed for whatever it was that the prophet was to face. And the same promise applies to us. God is always with his children, empowering us through the Holy Spirit to face whatever it is he calls us to face. So we don't fear we're to be faithful. He will equip us to stand firm. We need to trust him to do it. So as we close, let me ask, is there anything that you're holding back from the Lord in some sort of dishonesty, perhaps? The Jews of Jerusalem, they offered up words of confession. They went through the motions of sacrifice and fasting, but they held back from honest repentance. They didn't truly humble themselves before God, and as a result, they felt as if God truly abandoned him. And to some extent, God did turn away, of course, turning them over to the consequences of their sin. On the other hand, Jeremiah, he's completely free, honest in his grief wept for the nation, despaired by his trials. The fact that he was a prophet didn't somehow exempt him from suffering or sorrow. He freely took it to the Lord just as he needed to. God helped him get refocused, recommitted to preach without compromise. As for us, we neither want to hold back our true humble confession, nor do we want to hold back our honest emotions from our Lord Jesus. He both knows, of course, when our repentance is insincere and when we're trying to put on a super spiritual face. Neither is necessary. Confession, of course, isn't ritualistic. It's the first step, though, to true repentance. If there's something that God's dealing with in your life, then deal with it honestly. Humble yourself before the Lord. Ask for his help to change. Don't think you can mutter a prayer and just go back to things as usual. God isn't fooled by that sort of thing. But about your prayer life, have you tried to be, or at least appear to be, more spiritual than you are? And what's the point of that? Be honest with the Lord. You know, it's like we think Jesus doesn't know when we're hurting already and that we're confused and that we're despairing. Of course he knows. There's no sense in trying to hide that from him. Be honest with him. 
then you can allow him to minister to you in whatever way that he does and the only way that he can. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Jeremiah and his honesty. Thank you, Lord, that your word is completely transparent when it comes to struggles. And we all struggle. And we think, I shouldn't have these questions anymore. I've walked with the Lord too long for this. And, but if Jeremiah could struggle with those sorts of things, so can we. Paul seemed to beat himself up over his sin and questions and despair at times. And if they can, we can. So thank you, Lord, that it's so honest in those things. Help us be honest with you in our prayers. Help us not try to act hypocritical and trying to be more than what we are. At the same time, Lord, help us be honest when it comes to our sin, that it is what it is and it needs to be dealt with how you say to deal with it, not just try to put it off and hide it from you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities you give us to walk every day with new mercies, you're so faithful. Thank you for the promises we have in Christ. <laughs> I thank you that our relationship with you is based on his work. Oh, amazing grace in that. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, your name. Amen.